please pray with me. Holy God, open our eyes to your presence, open our ears to your call, open our hearts to your love. Amen. I have recently heard a Yiddish or Eastern European Jewish folk tale that goes something like this. Why did God not send an angel to tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Because God knew that no angel would take on such a task. Instead, the angel said, if you want to command death, do it yourself. This light-hearted tale may be the best way to introduce us to the text's absurdity as we grapple with the complexities of Genesis 22. Indeed, few episodes in the Bible have the power to infuriate, disturb, fascinate, and even encourage us all at the same time. Through the ages, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim scholars engaged in heated debates about the meaning of the story in which Abraham appears willing to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac in an act of unquestioning submission to the will of God. Or is there a different way to read this text? As we explore this ancient tale, we must find ourselves grappling with some fundamental questions. Was this truly a test of Abraham's faith? Does it then suggest a capricious and morally questionable God who subjects us to moment of unbearable anguish and terror merely to assess our loyalty? If it was indeed a test, did Abraham pass or fail? Did God expect him to obey wholeheartedly, disregarding his paternal love for Isaac? Should, I, should Abraham have ignored all ethical considerations and sacrificed an innocent child, tarnishing the image of God reflected in him as the father of all? Did the voice of Abraham, did the voice the Abraham, Abraham heard truly emanate from the divine, or was it perhaps a nightmarish projection stemming from the depths of his own mind? Ultimately, let's face it, the true meaning may forever elude us. However, let me emphasize one thing before we go any further. There are few other stories in the Bible that require our more explicit rejection and condemnation of the horrors it entails. There should be no place in Christian preaching to entertain discussions that justify acts of violence dehumanization, child abuse, or merciful, merciless slaughter of animals. Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, once said, if it is not about love, then it is not about God. Let's be clear, there is no love in an act of child abuse. So how do we then grapple with this deeply unsettling narrative of Abraham trusting his son, tying him up like an animal, and preparing to sacrifice him with a butcher's cleaver, as the Hebrew text says. This chilling account, known in the Jewish tradition as the Akeda, or the binding of Isaac, is conveyed with remarkable brevity, leaving much unsaid and um, inviting our interpretation. The thoughts and emotions of God, of Abraham, of Isaac, remain largely unspoken. The rabbis have then entered, uh, undertaken a task, this task of trying to understand it throughout the centuries, weaving interpretations and insights to shed light on the complex layers of this enigmatic tale. It's fascinating to explore how ancient Jewish Midrash literature delves into the complexities of Abram's character. In one particular piece of Midrash, Abraham questions the divine instruction in a pretty insightful manner. 
When God tells him to take his son up onto the mountain, Abraham astutely responds, I have two sons. God clarifies, saying, you're only one. Still, Abraham, driven by his deep love for both Ishmael and Isaac, asserts, this one is an only one to his mother, and this one is an only one to his mother, acknowledging that both sons hold unique places in their respective mother's hearts. But undeterred, God persists, saying, whom you love. Yet Abraham refuses to show favoritism for one and says, I love both of them. Finally, frustrated with Abraham, God merely says, Isaac. Here we witness Abraham's profound love for both of his sons and his unwillingness to prioritize one over the other. His responses portray a father grappling with some deep emotions in this unbearable situation. It highlights Abraham's character as one who seeks to also understand the true will of God in this command. But this Midrash also points out one other absurdity of this text. How can this omniscient, all-knowing God of all creation forget that that Abraham has two sons, or that Isaac is not even his firstborn. It just doesn't make sense. Perhaps then it is not so unorthodox to object to this traditional reading of this passage as divine test of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice everything and anything, even his beloved child, in submission to God's will. This conventional reading often overlooks Isaac's Isaac's humanity, reducing him merely to a symbol of God's promise to Abraham. However, to suggest that Isaac was merely a means to an end is both absurd and unjust. We must recognize that Isaac, like any child, has carries his own hopes, dreams, and aspirations His unique individuality, thoughts, and emotions should not be disregarded for some theological meaning. And let's be clear, none of us is a means to an end. What if, instead of viewing this story as a testament to unwavering faith, we consider it as a portrayal of our flawed humanity, of a world estranged from the boundless love of God? Søren Kierkegaard, in his uh, thought-provoking book, Fear in Trembling, presents an interpretation that challenges us. He suggests that if Abraham, who who, who is hailed as the father of faith due to his readiness to sacrifice Isaac, were to appear among us here and now, we would be most probably very willing to first ignore him and then to institutionalize him. We must then confront the reality and the possibility that Abraham, in his encounter with God's command, might have projected his own mind, his own thoughts and desires onto the voice that he believed was divine. It raises the question of whether his understanding might have been clouded by his own limitations. And so even and so only when the angel of the Lord finally appears and calls on him, Abraham gains a deeper understanding of God's purposes and a clear vision. In our lectionary translation, we hear that Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. But the Jewish Bible read in the synagogues is closer to its original Hebrew text and says, Abraham named the site site Adonai Yireh, whence the presence saying, on the mount mount of Yahweh there is vision. Robert Atler, a distinguished Hebrew scholar, 
delves into this intriguing linguistic connection between the significance of Mount Moriah and this verb yire that we've just heard. He says, beyond the tunnel vision of trajectory toward child slaughter is a promise of true vision. Yire is to mean to see. Perhaps it was only when Abraham heard the stern voice of the angel repeating his name twice and explicitly, explicitly commanding him twice to spare the child that Abraham's spiritual vision became clear and he saw the purposes of God. Perhaps it was only then that he recognized that his leap of faith was in the wrong direction. Having failed to protect the dignity of every single member of his family at one point or another, he again recognized that he might have failed the test or in the least misread God's command. And yet, God does what God always does, redeeming Abraham, saving Isaac, and leaving the covenant intact. This frightening and bewildering text challenges us to confront, confront the complexities of our own faith journeys. It prompts us to consider moments when we too may have misread God's will or veered, of course. It compels us to engage in honest self-reflection, recognizing that our understanding of God's purposes may sometimes be clouded or distorted. And it invites us to exercise genuine humility in listening for the word the Lord, of the Lord within us. I pray that we strive to learn from Abraham's experiences, embracing the importance of humility, discernment, and an unwavering commitment to protecting the inherent dignity of every human being, ensuring that we fulfill the divine call to love and honor all of creation. For far too long, people justified cruelty to others in the name of God. As we celebrate the 4th of July and read this text, you may be surprised that it is exactly this text that is quoted in the letters left by the perpetrators of 9-11. That's what happens when you misread and misuse texts of the Scripture. Are we morally and spiritually strong enough to stand up to the religious fundamentalists who usurp the right to speak for Christianity in their distorted visions of charity, leading them to ostracize and discriminate against other human beings. Let us remember that genuine faith and surrender to God's submission, to God's will, always leads us towards compassion, justice, and the well-being of all. What is not about love is not about God.